Good evening and welcome to the March edition of your Backyard Association. Brought to you by the Coweta County Master Gardeners Extension Volunteers. I'm Alan Summerlin and co-hosting the program tonight with me is Deborah Williams. The Backyard Association presents a monthly gardening program the second Tuesday of each month with the exception of December. All programs are free and are presented just for you. This evening, our program will be Zoom only. Hopefully, as we move into 2021, we will soon be able to deliver our programs in person as we have done over the last 10 years. However, surely we will be continuing with our Zoom program, Zoom presentation as well. Okay, next slide. Oh, it's not moving. Master Gardener programs operate under the leadership and guidance of the University of Georgia through county extension offices throughout Georgia. For issues regarding gardening, water quality, agribusiness, family wellness, and life skills, Coweta County Extension can help. You can see the contact information on this slide. Our big yellow bag spring fundraiser starts in just seven days. The soil cubed big yellow bag uh, sale starts on March 16th and goes through March the 20th. And every big yellow bag equals 27 30 pound bags of compost. That's over 300 pounds. When you order, you'll receive a $20 discount on each big yellow bag and Coweta Master Gardeners Extension Volunteers will receive $15 for each bag you buy. It will help fund our programs this year. And I love it because they deliver to my home and because Soil 3 is a very good product. You can order online at soil3.com using the code MGCOWETA3. And you need to enter that discount code, code to get that discount. On March the 27th at 10 a.m., Master Gardeners of Coweta County are gonna be presenting a, a Zoom presentation uh, on lawn care tips for homeowners. Uh, this will be practical steps for a healthy lawn. It's a timely time uh, to be prepared for the spring and summer. Again, that's Saturday, March the 27th at 10 a.m. I'm also very pleased that we, we will be having our annual spring plant sale this year. We'll have a different format. Uh, we will have People will have to do sign-ups to come to, at different times to attend a, the sale. You can check our Facebook page for updated information. Uh, our master gardeners are working very hard to make sure the plants are ready for the sale. The McGuffey Nature Center, along with its six hiking trails, are located in the Coweta County, Coweta County Fairgrounds complex. Master gardeners spend many, many hours each month planting native plants and removing non-native plants and doing various trail improvements, plant identifications, etc. To help with some of the expenses involved, we have a way that you could help, and that's by purchasing a brick paver for the Honor Memory Garden, which is on the paved purple trail. It's a nice picnic area, beautiful setting. We have over 100 uh, pavers already installed. Uh, and if you would like to have one, uh, maybe in honor of a grandchild or a child or a loved one, or maybe uh, the memory of a pet, uh, the, you would, the deadline for procuring your uh, paver for this year is May the 28th. So we'll continue to remind you each month but this is a very worthwhile cause. On Tuesday, April the 13th at 7 p.m., 
The Backyard Association will welcome Lisa Bartlett, the garden manager of Smith Gilbert Gardens in Kennesaw. Lisa is a horticulturist who has done a wonderful job updating the garden with award-winning exhibits and has made Smith, garden, G Smith Gilbert a great garden to visit for the entire family. She's a high energy speaker with a great sense of humor. Her topic will be hydrangea. There's one for every landscape. We are delighted tonight to have with us Mike Cunningham from Country Garden Farms, presenting three tips for, or, for a successful organic vegetable garden. Mike grew up on a farm here in Coweta County where he and his wife, Judy, and his mother, Cornelia, live today. He graduated from East Coweta High School and from Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College with a degree in horticulture. He was active in Coweta County 4-H club growing up, showing animals and participating in land and livestock judging. When he was in high school, he started what would be a lifelong passion of growing plants when his father helped him build a greenhouse in their backyard. He worked as a store manager for Pike Nursery and later opened a wholesale nursery called Southern Perennial, Perennial Growers and also a retail, retail nursery called Country Gardens. Mike and Judy have four sons and eight grandchildren and one additional on the way. Now that's a great, that's a grandchild on the way. Right. <laughs> yeah. After closing Country Gardens Nursery in 2011, Mike and Judy started growing organic vegetables to sell directly to the pub public through a subscription model called CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. Their, their youngest son, Joseph, started farming on Judy's family farm, producing milk, beef, chicken, pork, and eggs. Uh, and they are all sold at the farm stand, along with vegetables that Mike and Judy grow. The farm stand is at their home and gardens at 2050 Sharpsburg McCollum Road, which is Highway 154 across from Rock and Bees. Mike and Judy have a passion for teaching others how to grow, cook, and preserve good food. In, two, in 2017, Mike, along with help from Judy, authored a book on seven steps to organic vegetable garden. They teach classes at their farm as well as local gardening groups. Please welcome Coweta's own Mike Cunningham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> screen up here. There we go. Everybody see our slides there? Alan? Okay. Yep. Looks good. good. All right. Well, I'm glad to be with you tonight. Uh, even though we do have to do this uh, virtual, uh, it's always a pleasure coming to the Backyard Association, and I know the weather has been great lately. We've just had some beautiful days, and everybody's itching to get out in the garden, and toward the end of the presentation tonight, I'll talk a little bit about what we need to be doing right now in the garden. But I thought I would, uh, with so many things we can talk about in uh, doing an organic vegetable garden, that we could put it into um, several nights but we're going to concentrate on three tips tonight. And uh, as always, if you want to know more, uh, we do classes here at the farm and we uh, sent out an um, email uh, that Karen uh, forwarded to you. It has a lot of resources on there. So it's a place there where you can um, uh, see our website. You can uh, join our uh, closed gardening group called Grow Good Food. You just uh, go there. I gave the link for that and go there and it's a good place to ask questions. And so if you don't get your questions answered tonight, you can always reach me there and ask questions and show me pictures and maybe brag a little bit about what you're growing. 
And uh, so that's for uh, organic gardeners. And then uh, we also have a farm Facebook page that uh, anybody can look at. And it uh, has a lot of updates on what's available. And we do a weekly uh, newsletter with, uh, I do gardening tips in there. Judy does uh, recipes from things that we're growing on the farm. And then we also uh, update you on what's available at the farm each week. So uh, take advantage of that um, resource that we sent to you. And uh, Karen said that uh, if you didn't get it, if you registered late, that she would be sending those out to you. So everybody should get one. So it's not anything you need to look at tonight to follow along, but this will be a reference for you later on. So as we, as we think about uh, organic gardening, uh, an organic farm is we think about uh, what can I do or what isn't organic vegetable garden anyway. And what a lot of people will think about and what a lot of people will say is an organic farm, well, that's where they don't spray or that's where they don't use chemicals. But really it's so much more than that. And we're gonna talk about tonight the, some of those things. And if we just, um, you know, if we just do the, um, what we don't do, uh, what what uh, we don't spray and what we don't do, and it's a bunch of don'ts that really isn't uh, what we're looking for. Because uh, I can tell you that, let's see, that a garden of neglect is an organic garden, okay? So if we have, um, we don't do anything, then nature will cover the ground. And it may not be with plants that we want. Now in that picture, there may be something out there that you can eat. I know Judy will, she'll collect a lot of uh, wild uh, uh, weeds sometimes to put in my salad. And uh, I'm sure she could walk through that garden and even find something to eat out there. But what we're looking for is a balance between working with nature and uh, not letting nature take over. We want a productive garden. We want a garden, uh, that uh, makes biology and takes advantage of all the, that nature has to offer. Sometimes I think instead of saying organic garden, we need to say a biological garden because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be a um, father of the biology that's in the soil, that's with the insects and the uh, environment and not try to beat things over the head with a bigger hammer every time, but work with nature to have a productive garden. So do you think that the vegetables that we get today in the grocery store has the same nutritional value that they did 50 years ago? Well, there's several studies that have come out that say that uh, we're losing the nutrition in our food. So we're having to, we would have to eat more of those red bell peppers that look so good on that picture to get the same nutrition as if the red bell peppers that we were eating in the 60s, 1960s. And there could be a lot of reasons for that, but I believe a lot of it has to do with the soil. And so not only um, are we just not going to, if we're doing organic gardens or we're not going to spray chemicals on our food, we're also going to try to make them as nutrient dense as possible. We're also losing a lot of our um, topsoil. And in the um, whole United States, there's a, a, a net loss every year. Some places worse than others. Uh, some farms worse than others. But as a whole, we're losing our topsoil. And it may not be very much per year, but uh, we got to think about the next generation and what's going to happen 50 to 100 years from now. Soil is one of the most important um, resources that we have. Uh, plant growth uh, is our very existence because plants provide the oxygen that we need to breathe. And uh, without soil for them to grow in and enough of it, then we're gonna have um, problems producing enough food to feed everybody in the future. And what about the insects? Our pollinators and other beneficial insects are on decline. 
Um, now, the honeybee that's in this picture, now he is, uh, he's kind of a star of the show whenever we talk about pollinators and uh, attracting insects to the garden. Uh, everybody always thinks about the honeybee because he's big enough, we can see him and usually we can recognize him. And, uh, you know, he gives us that uh, sweet honey. So we're excited to, to get that. So he's the star of the show, but there's so many other insects that we need to uh, attract to our gardens. And we can create good habitat for beneficial insects by planting flowers that provide nectar and pollen. So as gardeners and farmers, what can we do? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And here are the three things. I present to you tonight that we need to till our gardens less, we need to plant flowers, and we need to mulch. I put the second one in as plant flowers. I didn't say what I usually say, and that is bring more bugs into the garden because everybody would be uh, running away if I told them that. But that's really the truth, that we do need to bring more diversity to our gardens. So let's talk about tilling less. Some of the benefits of reduced tillage are increasing our organic matter. This is going to improve our soil structure. It's going to reduce soil erosion and it's gonna benefit the microbes in the soil. Uh, to be able to uh, reduce tillage, we're gonna to have to do some of the other things like mulching and, and uh, composting and things like that. But we, there are definite benefits to it. Commercial farms now are turning to big equipment where they can uh, get seeds in the ground and they're doing more no-till and it's becoming a little buzzword now of regenerative agriculture. I would encourage you, if you haven't uh, seen it, there's a new movie out and you can get it on Netflix. It may be available other places on the web, but it's called Kiss the Ground. And it's all about regenerative agriculture, regenerating the soil, uh, improving our soils. And it's about farms that are thousands of acres that are practice, practicing uh, no-till or low tillage practices and they're building their soil up. Uh, so it's something that we can do as individual gardeners and small farms like ours and, uh, and something that big agriculture is uh, taking a look at and beginning to, things are beginning to change there as well. Our uh, tilling can do a lot of damage to the soil. And we look at things from the surface and we see, um, you know, that it looks nice and soft on top. And it's what we can't see a lot of times that is a problem. Every time that tiller turns over, it's striking the ground, maybe several inches under the soil, it's striking the ground and it's cause, it can cause a hard pan there. So you might have uh, four inches or, or so of soil on top of the ground that is uh, loose and pliable and looks real nice and you've gotten rid of all the weeds, but, uh, but you have done some damage there and you've damaged a lot of the microorganisms, the earthworms, a lot of the soil structure that's there with that tiller. And soil structure is important and we want the soil that has different size soil particles because we want air to be able to get down into the soil. Uh, we want water to be able to penetrate. When we get the rains, we want it to soak in the soil, not run off. And plant roots from a previous crop that was growing there or worms or any other critters that are in the soil are making channels down in that soil. And the microorganisms that are there are building um, particles and different size aggregates in the soil so the soil becomes more crumbly and that's what we're looking for and when we grind it up with a tiller or our plows we're destroying that structure every time we do it. There are occasions when we need to till and you know we're making uh, raised beds and and we do that on our farm where we raise up the soil to plant on raised beds and that works good because our soil 
that we have on our farm is heavy. It's got a lot of clay in it. So we want it to drain good. But what we're trying to do is not do con constant tilling. It's that constant tilling uh, once, twice a year where you tear everything up and start over or whether uh, you're using that tiller to go between the rows in your garden and tilling the weeds in there and you're constantly turning that over. Yeah, sure, the soil looks loose and it has, uh, it's almost uh, powdery, but you're making all those little particles the same size. And then when it rains, all that um, pressure from the raindrops starts making that soil hard and you're, you're uh, stuck with a crusted over soil sometimes and also with um, compacted soil. So every time we till, we're destroying that soil structure. Also in the soil, we want to have lots of uh, life. It's been said that a handful of good garden soil has more life, meaning mostly microbes, bacteria and fungi, than they are people who are populating the globe right now. So billions and billions of little tiny microbes are in good garden soil. And it has a direct relation to the same thing that's going on in our digestive system. When we uh, digest our food, we are depending upon a lot of enzymes, and bacteria, and things in our uh, digestive system to break down and digest our food. The same thing is happening in the soil. In fact, I like to say that the soil is the stomach of the plant. So as the plant needs all these microorganisms to digest the um, minerals and things that are in the soil. And without them, we're forced to feed, feed them, you know, liquid already digested uh, minerals like we would do in uh, liquid fertilizer and commercial fertilizers. And this is all part of the soil food web. We have on the left, we've got, you know, our sun up here and it's shining down on all the plants. You remember from your high school uh, biology class, that's photosynthesis and it is uh, making sugars. And these plants are growing roots down into the soil and down in the soil, there's, there's bacteria, there's fungi, protozoa, nematodes, yes, not all nematodes are bad, uh, anthropods. So there's a whole list of, uh, you know, things that we can't even see. And that's kind of the common theme, you know, as we go through this, we, a lot of things that we're uh, wanting to bring in our garden and increase in our garden and, and uh, benefit is are things that we can't see. Now you can see them with a microscope and you can, um, you know, take a look at some of these things there with a microscope, but a lot of times just, just in uh, with a naked eye, we can't see what's going on there. But it's there and the more we can do to help it, the better. And we're gonna talk about some of those things. The other thing is, uh, that has come to the forefront, oh, I don't know, in the last 10 or 15 years, is we're realizing how important mycorrhizal fungi is. And this is a fungus that is a good fungus that attaches to the plant root, and it has a symbiotic relationship with that plant root. So it's, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. The plant feeds the fungus, and the fungus then in turn has many, many little hyphae, which is like roots that go out all through the soil and exponentially increase the amount of surface area to absorb nutrients for that um, plant. You see the picture, uh-oh, let's see, go back. Okay, you see the picture on the left here is a, a plant root in the soil and the picture on the right is all that little white fibrous root there is the mycorrhizae that is attached to the plant root. Uh, sometimes that's, a, that's already in the soil. Sometimes we have to inoculate the soil to get that started. The other thing that that plant is doing is it, through photosynthesis, it is bringing in um, uh, sugars or manufacturing sugars in the leaf of the plant. And then it sends those sugars, not only to make the plant grow, but also 
to feed the, the biology in the soil, the mycorrhizae in the soil, and that's called root exudates. So there are sugars being released through the roots in order to feed the microbes in the soil so that the microbes in turn dissolve a lot of the minerals that are in the soil and feed the plant. So they are working hand in glove with each other. And we want to keep that process going and encourage that process and, and not uh, disturb it. And that's the reason, that's one of the reasons for the uh, no-till and some of the cover crops. We can also, you know, do soil from potting soil, you know, which would be natural things like peat moss and perlite, vermiculite, uh, coconut core, things like that. And they definitely will have soil life in them. Um, but things like your, um, like Deborah was talking about the, the soil cube that uh, comes in the big yellow bag, that would be uh, compost and you would, it would be good to add some of that even if you're using potting soil to fill your garden beds with or if you're just using native soil to add to it. <clears throat> One of the things that we uh, started doing several years ago was teaching a class on lasagna gardening. Now, lasagna gardening is not a garden where you grow plants to put in your lasagna dish. It is uh, referring to the fact that you layer different types of organic material, uh, food scraps, uh, leaves, a straw, wood chips, and you layer upon layer of those, just like you layer lasagna with with pastas and meats and cheeses. And you come up with this uh, basically a compost pile that then you top it off with, uh, with some already made compost, maybe the last inch or two. So you have something to sow a seed into or plant into. And all that um, organic material that you layered in there then becomes soil. And that's a good way, and uh, if you can collect all those items together, uh, a good way to stretch your dollars when you're uh, uh, making a garden, because you can fill those boxes up with uh, layers and layers of compost instead of um, having to buy something to do that. Now, buying compost uh, to put on the very top to finish off that bed to put in there, of course, is always a good idea. And we'll have classes on that at the farm uh, if you're ever interested in it. There's a book written uh, called Lasagna Gardening. There was a lady back in the 60s, I believe, um, Ruth Stout, who first come up with, um, not that she come up with the idea, but she wrote about it. And uh, she did a lot of articles about the lazy gardener. And her story was, that uh, she was always, she moved out to the country and she wanted to have a garden and every year she would get a neighbor to come in and plow her garden. And he would come, you know, when he got around to it. He wasn't uh, going to come, you know, until he got his garden plowed and his things done. And so she was always waiting on him. Well, one year she just got tired of waiting and she had some uh, spoiled hay and she had some other organic material from the you know, from the cows and uh, cow manure and different things. And she just layered all that on top of each other in the ground and planted in it and never broke the ground up in the beginning. And she had one of her best gardens ever. And over the years, she wrote a lot of articles for uh, Organic Gardening Magazine and, and uh, Rodale Press on how to do this. And so it's not a new idea. It's been around a long time and, um, you know, there are a lot of stories about uh, early farmers who used a lot of organic matter in their uh, gardening and farming. We use, we've started using a lot of uh, shredded leaves and leaf mold, and sometimes we would be, um, you might have been scared if we saw that white uh, fuzzy stuff on the leaves and thinking that we might be uh, contaminating our garden there. But um, most gardens, uh, especially if you start one in a, a lawn or where there's been pasture or grass growing in the past, it's mainly bacteria, dominated by bacteria in the soil. And what, ideally what we would want would be a balance of fungi and bacteria. And by adding um, woodland things, uh, wood chips and 
bark and uh, leaves and things like that to the garden, we're introducing some of those woodland uh, fungus because pasture land and grasslands are, are mainly um, bacterial dominated soils and woodlands uh, in the woods are uh, dominated mainly by fun fungus. So in a vegetable garden, we'd like a balance of the two and we can do that by introducing some of those things from the woods to the vegetable garden. Now this has been one of the things that we have seen the most uh, production from is our cover crops. Uh, and we're learning that we need to keep something growing on the soil all the time. And this is doing a lot of things for us. Uh, it's not only um, we have some legumes that we plant and legumes are plants that can fix nitrogen from the air and um, release it into the uh, soil for the next crop that's coming on. Uh, but also uh, things like rye that uh, are just grasses. And this is like rye, like you make rye bread from, but we're not growing it for the grain, we're growing it, it as a soil builder. And it has a tremendous root system. So it's putting down all these roots into the soil. And like we talked about with the root exudates before, the sun shines on that leaf, that leaf makes sugars from photosynthesis, and then it releases those sugars into the soil and that increases the biology in the soil and the microbes in the soil and gives them something to eat. And they colonize around that. Uh, and diversity is one thing that uh, is really the best. You can, if you can see it, it's not too easy to see, but there's uh, clover in here. And then this other leaf here is vetch. And then the tall grass is, uh, rye, not rye grass, but a burza rye or grain cereal rye. And we can grow that during the winter months. So we can plant it in the fall of the year, grows through the winter, and then we, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we change that over to a crop in just a minute. And then during the summer, there's some things that grow well. Buckwheat is one, Sudan grass, and peas, uh, where we're growing peas for to pick to eat or just peas for um, a, a, a cover crop. If we've got a bare time in our garden, and this doesn't matter where you've got a, a four by eight uh, raised bed box or where you're growing, you know, in the ground, you got a little garden spot that's, uh, um, you know, 20 by 60 or, or whatever size you have, you can, you can make use of these cover crops. And never let the soil be bare. Always have something growing there. And sometimes in the summer, we'll have a little downtime late summer between uh, maybe the tomatoes are starting to fizzle out. And it's not time to plant our fall vegetables yet. And we'll grow buckwheat. And I have a slide of it in just a minute to show you. In fact, the background behind me is a field of buckwheat that was taken on our farm. But the, uh, it's a real quick crop, so it can come and, and bloom and then um, be gone in a short amount of time. The other thing that we are learning how to do is to use clover um, in with our uh, cool season crops. So this is where we planted last summer, late summer, like in late August, early September, and we we grew all of our greens, our collards, our kale, grew our broccoli, our cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all those in the brassica family. And they didn't really finish up until just recently. We've just, we picked and picked and picked on them all through the late fall and winter. And um, now they're just about, they're just about gone. But we also wanted a cover crop in there. Well, it was, you're not gonna have very good luck sowing your seeds in January for a cover crop. So what we did was we sowed clover seed underneath the uh, collards and kale and broccoli plants after they were up and growing. So they were up and growing in uh, September. And so early October we went in there and we scattered seed underneath them. And then the, they, it began to grow slow at first, but then the collards and uh, kale were already big. So they, they were uh, big enough that they didn't compete with the clover. And now we've got a crop of clover as a cover crop. The kale and collards are all finished. 
So what we'll do with this is we'll go in and we'll mow it down as close to the ground as we can. And you can do the same thing in a small garden with a weed eater. You can take it and weed eat it down. And then um, we'll cover it with a tarp for a couple of weeks and to uh, kill it back so that we're ready to plant our next summer crop in that same spot. So we might be planting beans or okra or, or um, cucumbers or something here in a few weeks. <coughs> so this is what we're, when we talk about using tarps uh, to reduce tillage and to control weeds, it's, um, you may not be familiar with it, but it uh, is something that's really worked well. And there are a lot of farms starting to use this. And they're taking silage tarps, just the tarps that the farmer would use to cover his silage pits with. And it's, they're black on one side and white on the other. Um, there's a um, garden supply company down in South Georgia called Hoss Tools, H-O-S-S. -S. I know they sell them. Uh, there's uh, on the line, you can go to Farmer's Friend and buy them there. You can also buy, uh, what we use a lot is uh, just a real heavy landscape fabric, not the stuff that you can hold up to the light and see through, but a real heavy gauge uh, landscape fabric. And uh, we put this over the soil and what this does is it kills a lot of the weeds underneath it. It also would kill, terminate or stop your cover crop from growing because that rye and vetch and clover, we don't want it competing with our next crop. So when it's at the end of its cycle and we're ready to plant the, our spring tomatoes, say for instance, we're gonna cut that uh, cover crop down to the ground as close to the ground as we can scalp it. And then we're gonna cover it with that tarp for several weeks, um, maybe up to two months, depending on the time of year. And that's gonna terminate it or stop it from growing. And then we're able to go in there and start planting our next crop. Uh, but you've got all the benefit of the leaves on top of the ground that was cut with the mower. And you've got all the benefit of the uh, roots that are left over from that uh, ryegrass and vetch and clover. They're still in the ground. As they rot, they're adding organic matter back to the soil. They're feeding the microbes in the soil. And then the uh, grass clippings or the clippings from all that cover crop that's on top is going to help to be a somewhat of a uh, mat there or for a uh, mulch but we will mulch heavier even after that with um, uh, some leaves on top of it and sometimes we use compost as a uh, layer on top of the ground to cover up the last uh, cover crop or whatever after it's been tarped and then put about an inch or so of compost scattered across the top of the soil and we'll plant directly into it. Okay, so we got a soil going. We got, we got a good organic soil, lots of uh, microbes, and a lot of uh, life in the soil. Now, what about the pollinators? And a lot of talk now about pollinator gardens and, and pollinators, but I want to tell you that it's more than just pollinators. It's the bugs that eat the other bugs. And these are the insects that we want to bring into our garden. Now everybody knows the lady beetle and probably the praying mantis. And these are just a few of the ones that um, are eating other insects. And it's not so much that the adults are eating the insects, but their young are. And so, if we look at these, this slide of the ladybug, we might not, we can recognize it pretty well, but we might not recognize this uh, little long alligator looking uh, ladybug uh, larvae right here. And like a, kind of like a lot of teenagers, there's, they're an endless, uh, uh, endlessly hungry. They're always eating. And these are little aphids on the back of this leaf here. And that, little uh, ladybug larvae is going to eat his weight more than his weight in those aphids every day. Now the adult, she'll eat a few aphids, but she's also eating from your flowers, from your nectar and your pollen and your flowers. And that's what makes her stay in the garden. And if she stays around the garden, she's going to lay her eggs so that 
she can, uh, her babies are going to have some, something to eat. And like a lot of insects, you have life stages in the life cycle. So the adult lays the eggs, and then you have a larva, and then it goes into a pupa or cocoon, and it comes back out as an adult. And some insects have more than that, and have several, you know, several different stages of their life, but they all have a life cycle where they go through uh, different stages. And usually what we're trying to attract to the garden is the adult, so that the larvae will be there to uh, eat the uh, insects. Now, this is the old tomato hornworm. It eats on our tomatoes. And I don't know if you've ever seen this in your garden before or not, but if you ever do, don't squash him at this point, because what those little white sacks are on his back is where a parasitic wasp, not a red wasp, the kind that sting you, but a parasitic wasp that is so tiny that he zooms by your eye and you don't even know that he exists. And he goes along and he can sting or stab into a little aphid and, uh, or a caterpillar or a lot of other kind of insects. And she is depositing eggs in there. And then in the case of the aphid, uh, the it lives inside on that caterpillar. Those were egg sacs from the top of the, on the back of the caterpillar. But the larvae of that uh, wasp is eating the insect from the inside out. And if you ever see dead aphids on the back of a, uh, a leaf and it looks like a little, uh, their back was opened up with a can opener, pop, lid popped up, that's where that, uh, Larvae ate the aphid, and then he escaped to be another uh, flying wasp at some point. So they're doing their job by keeping the bad bugs in check. And if we kill everything, you know, if we go in there and we use neonicotinoids or some of these uh, strong um, pesticides, then we're wiping out everybody, the good and the bad. And guess what comes back first is usually the bad insects. And then we're stuck in a cycle of trying to control the bad insects or the insects that we don't want to eat our plants. So what do you do to, to create more insects in the garden to get more of those to come? Well, this is uh, Judy and, and she's standing next to a flowering carrot. And uh, this was uh, a plant that she came up with and we started sowing the seeds of it and uh, using it all around the garden. And a lot of the insects really like this because most of them are small, very tiny. And so they like these flat blooms so they can get up on, they can get up on top of these blooms and walk around and get nectar and pollen from there without having to go down into a uh, tube or tubular flower like, you know, the hummingbird, he can get his nectar out of a tubular flower and the butterfly can reach down with his, um, long tongue and get nectar that way too. But these little tiny insects, they need flat flowers. So think about uh, Queen Anne's lace. This wild carrot, it really doesn't make a carrot. It just has a flower, uh, it has a flower. Call it in the carrot family, but it's um, not, not a carrot you grow to eat. And then um, think about some of your herbs and basils and um, oregano and chives and all those things are, are really good at attracting uh, beneficial insects. And in your handout I gave you, there's a um, link in there that you can go to, to see a whole list. So you don't have to, you don't have to write them down tonight and memorize them. Uh, then in, in the summertime, we'll grow buckwheat as a cover crop. And you wouldn't believe how when we walk out into this um, field with all these white blooms, it's alive. There are little buzzing going on everywhere and every kind of little insect is coming in there to get their share of that nectar. Something we don't plant enough of that we are going to in the future is some of the wildflower mixes. And uh, there's a Southeastern wildflower mix that was developed at University of Georgia down at the Griffin campus years ago. And it's still for sale a lot now. So that can be planted. I think fall is the right planting time for it. But diversity is what you want. And then if you're planting solid crops or things at some point, always change it up and, and add different things because nature is not a monoculture. Nature likes diversity. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our mulching and what we do to 
uh, mulch to control weeds. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to smother the weeds. Now we've uh, pulled our uh, uh, tarps and over a lot of our beds, you know, for those few weeks. And we've got some of the seeds that are near the top of the ground to germinate. And because it was dark underneath that tarp, they germinated and they died. And then we um, plant our plants and then we add some type of mulch. We've used leaves and wood chips, straw and compost like we looked at before. Uh, all those different things. Um, I think I'd, the only thing I'd steer you away from is some of the colored mulches that have dyes in them. But other than that, anything, um, pine straw even would work. And, uh, and we do that to smother the weeds. Because we're not tilling, we're not bringing new weed seeds up to the surface. And then what uh, weed seeds were there where that tarp was on it, some of those sprouted and those died. And now we're finishing them off by putting more mulch on top of the ground. Of course, if we're sowing seeds, we've got to wait for our seedlings to get up and then we can mulch around them. But if we're doing plants, we can mulch right away. And one of the things that we've hit on lately that we really like is uh, shredded leaves and using that for mulch. And you can see my big pile there. And, um, you know, in the fall of the year, everybody's trying to get rid of the leaves. And a lot of the landscapers are blowing them off the yards. And this one um, landscape we uh, have been getting leaves from for years, he sucks that up at the street. They blow it from the yards out into the curb. And then they come along and they suck that up into a big, with a big vacuum into the back of a truck. And as he does that, it grinds them up a little bit. And he has, and it's a dump truck, and then he brings it to our farm and dumps those leaves there. And then we have to use a front load with a tractor and wheelbarrows and different ways to, you know, distribute them all around the farm and to get them out. But uh, as a gardener, you have access to leaves every fall, and your neighbors have leaves that they're throwing away, or some people are burning them, some people are sticking them in bags and putting them out by the curb. You know they're they're usually trying to get rid of them so as a gardener you should use that that resource and uh, and use it to your advantage so we're putting them pretty thick too they're three inches thick or more on the ground and you wouldn't believe all the worms that we find when we dig in there and it keeps the ground covered it keeps the ground soft and the worms like it too they'll be working alive in there Sometimes we've used uh, wheat straw as mulch, and that works too. I like the leaves better because you don't have to pay for those, but uh, wheat straw will work and, uh, and does a, a similar thing. So kind of to bring this all together and to recap what, what we were talking about tonight is that if we can do less tillage, and that doesn't mean no, absolutely never till, but don't till as often or don't till as much, and then um, use our uh, mulches to cover the ground so we're not having to go through there with a hose or tillers. And it'll actually be easier once you get this uh, process going um, and you get rid of, you have to get rid of some of your perennial weeds. I know we still have struggle with like nut grass and wild onions and things that have deep roots down in the soil, but we uh, were able to keep uh, a lot of our little grassy weeds and all out with the mulch. And it's not always perfect, but it does work a lot better than, than having to uh, cultivate and till all the time. And I think you'll find that in your garden as well. And, uh, and as far as the flowers go and um, attracting beneficials to the garden, look for things that are natives because a lot of these insects evolved with some of the native plants that we have, so they work better. Look for things that are um, have nectar and pollen in abundance and are close to the surface where they're, they're able to get to them real easy. One of the little annuals that we grow is called Elysium, annual sweet Elysium, and uh, it, it attracts a lot of good pollinators. So I think I put a, a link in there to some flowers that you can grow in your garden that'll produce a lot of uh, nectar and pollen to bring the beneficials in. So use that resource and look at all the different things that you could do there. But uh, 
I'm going to uh, also want to tell you a little bit tonight about uh, what it's time to do. So we've been planting our cool weather crops, which are all your brassica family, your collard, your kale, your broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, all those can be planted now. With the stipulations, you got to keep your a cover handy. We're not supposed to have any real cold weather in the foreseeable future, but that could change. And then we won't be planting our uh, warm season vegetables like our tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, uh, squash, beans, corn, all that will be in April. And we, our average, um, you know, last frost date here is somewhere around the 1st of April. It varies every year a little bit. Sometimes it's the end of March. Sometimes it's late April. We still have frost. So I always have a, have during March and April, always be prepared for any kind of cold weather that might be coming. Your cool weather crops will take a little frost. They're not gonna be hurt when it's down in the upper 20s. But uh, if it were to go real cold, um, down in the low 20s and that sort of thing, then you need to cover them. Your tomatoes and peppers and all your warm season crops cannot stand that at all. So you've got to wait till most of that is over with or all of it is over with and then plant those. And that's usually around the first part of April. And still, even if you plant it on the first of April, you still need to be have a plan B where you can cover your crops in case it does get cold again. So that's my last slide. And so I was going to open it up for questions tonight and maybe some of you got it in the chat box. I'll, I guess uh, I need to close my screen out. Okay. Okay, if you could just type your questions into the chat box. I'm sure you have some questions. One of the things that I get asked a lot is uh, about uh, compost. And I think you've got a good uh, source there with that uh, soil cube or soil three. And um, it's uh, made by Supersod. I think it's a company that produces that. And I know them a little bit. And uh, they're producing that on their farm down in um, Fort Valley or Perry down that way somewhere. And that bag is big. I mean, it's, um, uh, they deliver it on a truck with a forklift. So you're getting, a, you're getting probably somewhere around 27 cubic feet uh, or so of soil, uh, which is about a, close to a yard. And it's a rich compost. And uh, some of the other compost that uh, I've seen around some of the black cow, KOW, if you just need a bag or two of it, that works pretty good. You can pick it up at a lot of your garden shops or make your own compost. is always a good plan if you're a gardener to have some, always have some compost going, but you never seem to have enough of it, never seem to have it at the right time. Okay, I do have some questions now. Um, from John Hinman, he says, I struggle with eggplant leaves being eaten early by insects. Suggestions? Yeah, that's a um, leaf hopper, or not a leaf hopper, flea beetle that's doing that. Yeah, I had to get a little help from Judy over here in the corner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, flea beetle. And we have the same problem, and it's uh, inherent with uh, eggplant. And one of the things you can do, there's something called a floating row cover. And you could buy one on Amazon. I don't know that there's anywhere locally that you can get it. But it's a real, it's an insect netting, basically. And so later on, your eggplants need to be exposed to pollinators and all. But when they're young, they don't. So you can um, cover them. Uh, the row cover can lay right on top of it. Or you can make a little hoop out of a piece of PVC or a piece of wire and go over the top and keep them from uh, coming in. So that's probably one of the best things. And once they get established and get going, um, the flea beetles really can't harm it. They may make a few holes in the leaf later on, but the plant will outgrow it. It's in that early stage when it's young that they can do the most damage to your eggplant. So um, there is also, and I haven't done this yet, but there's also a um, 
beneficial nematode that will attack the flea beetle larvae in the ground. And we're going to experiment with trying some of that. You can buy that, uh, I think, from uh, Arbico um, online. At, uh, their, they sell garden supplies, but you can buy the, the uh, beneficial nematodes and spread them out into the garden and they will attack the larvae stage, not the adult, but the larvae stage. So we're, uh, we're going to experiment with some of that. I'll let you know how it comes out, but that's, that's another alternative. Okay, the next question is Charm Ridley. I don't, I'm not totally sure if that's correct, but what are some other specific flowers to plant now to attract beneficial insects? Okay. Um, pretty soon it's going to be warm enough for buckwheat to come up. I mean, we may be a few weeks away from that, but you would be surprised how quick that comes up. And it um, maybe in the next three weeks we'll be able to plant uh, some buckwheat. The uh, sweet alyssum is something we're going to be uh, putting out soon. You know, you're not going to get uh, as many flowers uh, in March that you plant now, you would have to have planted some things back in the fall, like that wildflower mix, for instance, if it was planted back in the fall, some of that poppies and things like that would be coming up and blooming now. But anything you plant now will be for your late spring and summer going forward. Um, so I always tell people the buckwheat is one of the easiest things. You can just sow it right on top of the ground and just pat it in the ground or step on it, the seed, step it in the ground. You don't even have to cover it up. And uh, if we have just a few warm days, uh, it's not going to tolerate the frost. So it's probably just a, or a few weeks away from planting it. But it comes up quick, and then you'll have blooms on it just within a few weeks. And so that, that works real good. And then um, any of your herbs uh, that flower, I've seen a lot of uh, beneficial insect come to herb flowers. So when the basil, we don't always want our basil to go to seed or to flower because we uh, want to keep gathering it. But we always love a lot of our basil, a portion of it anyway, go to seed and don't keep trimming on it so that it goes to seed and then, uh, or to flower and then the insects really come after it. And I, there's a list, that, a pretty long list that's uh, in the resources that you can link to to find out some things. Okay, here's a question from Flo Winship. Bob Westerfield recommends clear plastic to solarize a vegetable bed. Is your black landscape fabric doing something different than solarizing? Or are you just making all clover die? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're, it's different. That's solarization. And you're doing that for a different purpose. Uh, when you cover the ground with the clear plastic, you're the heat under that, you're raising the heat a lot more. Even though that plastic is black, or I mean that uh, tarps are black, it's really not raising the temperature underneath the plastic as much. It is some, but not, not as much as clear. Whereas clear is letting the light through. And so, and your um, solarization is when you're kind of sterilizing the top inch or two of your soil. And that's not a bad thing to do every once in a while, but it's different than what we're doing is oculation. And we're, we're um, blacking out the sun or blacking out the light uh, underneath. And uh, it's, a, it's in a different context, different, for different reasons. Okay, and Karen typed in that uh, you, your email is mikec at countrygardensfarm.com. Um, and I think you also have uh, something on your website, a page on your website where you answer questions too. Yeah, it's on Facebook. Oh, Facebook. So it's okay. called, it's a, a gardening group. It's called Grow Good Food. And uh, you have to, so it's a private group. So only people in that group can see it. And you have to answer three questions. They're not questions to trick you or hard questions. We just want to have gardeners, you know, in there. So we ask three questions and there's no right or wrong answer. And we know you're not a robot or whatever if you answer the questions. And then we, I let you in and then there's about 200 and something people in the group. Um, we share information. I, always, I try to post in there. Uh, didn't post much in the winter, but now I've started posting in there pretty regular. 
or uh, let you know what it's time to be doing, that sort of thing. If you can put a picture in there or when you ask a question, that helps me a lot of times to identify things that you're talking about. So we, get, we use that and I, I stay pretty active on it. And then we have a farm page where we list things, uh, activities we're doing on the farm. Also gives you some behind the scenes of what goes on with the animals and with the crops and everything. And that's on our Country Gardens Farm Facebook page. But that's just uh, for everybody to look at. But the Grow Good Food page, and there's a link in, those res in that resource page that you can click on, it'll take you there. And then you can uh, answer the questions and become part of the group. Okay, from from uh, Merle Shoulder, uh, what if all your leaves are large oak leaves? Get your lawnmower out and run over them with the lawnmower and chop them up. Uh, it's nothing wrong with the big leaves; they're they're just harder to work with because when you're trying to tuck them around plants and all, they're bigger. And when they're chopped up, they tend not to blow as much. They'll kind of mat together and they won't uh, get blown, you know, start blowing everywhere. So uh, a lawnmower, anything you cut your grass with is you can just run over those leaves with a lawnmower. And if you've got a bagger, you know, you can bag them up and then dump it out in a big pile somewhere or just blow them up in a windrow. But that'll, uh, that'll work. Okay. I think that's it. I think that's all the questions. I don't see any more. All right, good. We want to invite everybody to come out to see us at the farm. We're always there on uh, Fridays and Saturdays from 9 to 4. And uh, be sure you sign up for our emails, uh, newsletter. We'll be letting you know when we have uh, classes coming up. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. That was a great program. I'd like to remind everyone about the Lawn Care Tips for Homeowners workshop, which is Saturday. March the 27th at 10 a.m. Hope that you'll uh, attend and benefit by that. And also look forward to seeing each one of you uh, at uh, on our April 13th backyard program uh, that with Lisa Bartlett. That's going to be a great program on hydrangeas. Um, I'd also like to mention that. Uh, in reference to the soil three, uh, that's there's 810 pounds uh, in in the cube, and that's soil uh, soil cube. I would challenge you to Google soil cube, and it and there's a three minute video showing how they make that, and it will make a believer out of you. And their product and their customer service is really unreal. I've purchased myself and uh, they make it so easy, it's just unreal. It's a great product. But anyway, that's it for tonight. Thanks again so much, Mike. You did a great job. We, we all learned a lot. We look forward to seeing everyone uh, on the 27th for the lawn or possibly on April the 13th for our uh, next BYA program. Good night, everyone, and good gardening. That was great, Alan. Okay, it was good.